Good morning. 9.46, so time to get started this morning. Give everybody a moment to move in and grab your majesty hymnals this morning. We're going to turn to number 612 this morning. And i got a passage of scripture I'd like to just read before we sing this song this morning. From Psalm 73, verse 1. 70, Psalm 73, verse 1 says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are, are of a clean heart. And I think we could each insert our name in there, right? In the place of Israel. Truly God has been good to us. We need to bless His name today. I trust you came this morning with hearts full of ready to worship our Lord and our Savior this morning to just give glory and honor to His name and thank Him for all He's done for us. So number 612 this morning, number 612, have a little fun with this one as we change keys each time we sing a verse, all right? Number 612, God is so good. soon we see the signs every day don't we let's have a word of prayer this morning let's stand together and we'll have a word of prayer and then you're dismissed to your classes this morning all right i believe the teen group unless somebody is doing the teen group the van has notified i believe the teen group staying up here this morning all right okay let's have a word of prayer our heavenly father we are so thankful to come into your house this morning help us lord to come before you with clean hearts help us to come before you with thankful hearts and with joyful hearts in you this morning. We pray that every aspect of this service would bring glory and honor to your name. From the singing to the preaching to each teacher this morning that's teaching their class. Lord, help us to be have hearts prepared. Help us not to just come here today as another day of the week, another our duty to come to church, but let us come because we want to be in your house this morning. We want to be in your presence. We so desire your presence among us this morning, Lord. And we desire your Holy Spirit to come down amongst us and upon our preacher as he preaches the word this morning. We thank you and we praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed to your classes.
Uh, see, I tell you what, let's swing that around. I think. Decide that. Oh, I mean, tell you what, I make a train wreck of it, didn't I? Here we go. Now, if we can take it around there. <clears throat> All righty. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, brother. Appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> we're going to be looking this morning at the subject of the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. And uh, we've been looking at a lot of things like the rapture of the church, the tribulation period, but we're look, look at the thousand-year reign of Christ. <clears throat> and so let's go to the Lord and pray. Father, thank you for this day that you've given us. And I pray, God, that you'll guide and direct us, help us to rightly divide the word of truth, uh, Lord, to study to show ourselves approved. And we thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the glimpse into the future that you've given us. We thank you for the truthfulness of your word, and I pray, God, today, help us lift up our eyes beyond this sordid, sick, sinful, wicked place, Lord, that's sin-cursed, and all the filth and nastiness and terribleness about us. And help us, Lord, to look for a day that you've promised when righteousness will rule in this earth, when Jesus will rule and reign with the rod of iron, God, when Satan is bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. God, I tell you what, I look forward to that day, and Lord, just think that we'll be in a new glorified body with Jesus ruling and reigning, the devil in the pit. Lord, I tell you what, I appreciate it, and I mean it. And so, Lord, help us to rejoice as we study today. Help us to be a blessing to each other. Help us get our eyes off of this old world and come in and look at our eyes on Jesus today, and it's in his name I pray, amen. Take your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20. Good to have everybody out today. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate God being here. He's never leave us nor forsake us. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 20. One of the things I want to do this morning is draw out a, a timeline in the book of Revelation. All righty. And just to kind of get it, there's a logical division in the book of Revelation. Chapter 1 is your introduction. And I'm going to draw a line like this here. Chapter 1 is your introduction. Chapter 2 and 3 is God's letters to the church. And they are uh, also a picture, the picture of the church. It's, it's problems, it's blessings, uh, but it's a historical picture of the history of the church written beforehand. Chapters 4 and 5 are a picture, uh, it's in the heavenlies. It actually is the church is taken out. It's a picture of the throne of God and some things going up in the heavenlies. Chapter 6 through chapter 18 is, a, is the tribulation period. Okay? And then chapters 19 and 20 are judgments upon this earth and also pre about, about the thousand year reign that will come. And then chapters 20... 1 and 22 is the new heaven and new earth and eternity. And that's your outline on the book of Revelation. If you'll always keep that in mind, it'll help you as you're reading. Now, when you're in the book of Revelation, there are scenes that are in heaven, there are scenes that are on earth, there are scenes that are in the bottomless pit, and I mean there are scenes everywhere. And so when you're reading, you've got to make sure you understand where this is talking about. There are issues that goes back clear to the Old Testament that were prophesied about and laid in there to... Uh, about this. I don't claim to have everything understood about Revelation. If anybody tells me they do, I don't believe them. But this is your general outline of it. What we're going to be looking at today is this 19 and 20 as it relates to this millennial reign, the coming back of Jesus Christ to the earth, setting up his kingdom. And he says a thousand years, and we're going to read it right now. So let's go to chapter 20. And uh, now keep in mind that in Revelation 19, in verse number 11, Christ has come back uh, in power and in glory with the armies that's in heaven following him upon white horses, verse 15. Verse uh, number 15 says, Out of his mouth go the sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress and the fierceness of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Great battle going on there around Jerusalem and in Israel uh, at that time. Um, folks, listen, it just looks to me like things are lining up. Uh, the anti-Semitism that you're seeing swell its head in America is a dangerous, dangerous sign, but it's also 
foretelling what's going to happen. Because the armies of the world are going to be gathered against Jerusalem at this time. There's a, I haven't listened to it. There's a preacher I've seen has a message out entitled, uh, America is going to turn on Israel. And he uses the scripture as a basis for that. And it's, you know, but I don't, you know, I, that doesn't mean you have to individually or we should as a church. And I'm going to say again publicly and overline, this church stands for Israel, with Israel, unequivocally, without any apology. And we do that based upon what the Bible teaches. And uh, so if you, if you hate Israel, you hate Jew, Jewish people, you're not going to be comfortable here. And you probably ought to find you a different pastor in a different church. Because I'm not going to be able to pastor you. Okay? Just being honest with you, they knew you was monkeying around about it. And uh, my Savior is Jew. <laughs> my King is a Jew. <laughs> Amen. And so that doesn't mean that I approve of everything that goes on in Israel. Doesn't mean I approve of everything that a Jewish person would do, but I don't approve of everything Gentiles do. I don't even like everything I do. I don't like how I act about 80% of the time anyway. How many's ever got mad at you because of how sorry and low down you are? You ever get mad at you? Say, how, boy, I'm, old Apostle Paul, we know that. Why am I thus? Oh, wretched man that I am. But I'm thankful that I'm not depending on me. I'm depending on him and his righteousness. Well, so he came. He comes back and, and verse number 17 says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the great supper of the great God. If you want to write down some references on that, that goes back to the Old Testament, Ezekiel 39. Uh, is a reference to that. Also Luke 17, Matthew chapter 24, Jesus talks about that. Verse number 18, this is after the battle now, that they may eat the flesh of kings and flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Just to insert a little bit here, there is a triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. There is a triune satanic, a satanic trinity. Beast, the false prophet, and... Um, yeah, beast, false prophet, and, and the devil. Anyway, uh, so you get down to, so the beast and the false prophet here are put into the lake of fire, and that is over with eternally for them. But the devil is not quite done with this thing. Verse number 20, on the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, whose sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. This is a wild scene. Back in the Old Testament, it said that the bridle will run deep as a horse, uh, blood will run as deep as a horse's bridle. It's taking about, basically, the idea is about four foot. It's a battle over there. I'm talking about, you're talking about files of the air. God's going to call men from the globe to eat the flesh of these people that fought against Israel. And it actually is, if you go in, well, I don't want to go there, somewhere, but the, the armies are coming in. It's going to look like it's over for Israel. Yeah. That finally Satan is going to get to do to them what he wants to do. But that's when our Lord's coming back. Amen. And he's going to gather them all in, in for the... You see, this Jesus has not preached much yeah. in churches. Boy, you're talking, about, you're talking about a man of war. He is a man of war. So, <clears throat> now we come to verse number, chapter number 20. And this is where we're going to get into this issue coming into the millennial reign. Millennial means thousand year, okay? Millennial, thousand year. All right, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon. There it is. I was trying to think of the word dragon. That's another word for the devil. Beast, the false prophet, and the dragon. That's your satanic trinity. That old serpent. Well, that takes you back to where? Genesis chapter 3. Which is the devil and Satan. Now I'll tell you the Holy Ghost is making sure you understand who this is talking about here. And bound him. How long? A thousand years. So when, uh, when Christ comes back here in this, this night 2020. And, and so Satan is going to be bound. 
in the bottomless pit. Somebody said, where's that at? I believe it's in the heart of the earth. I don't know where you think it is, but there's a bottomless pit. I believe it's in the heart of the earth. Verse number two, verse number three, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a season. I just now thought, did we get handouts? There's handouts back here. Does anybody have your, how many got a handout on millennial reign? You got yours? I think there's a bunch more back there on the table. If I could get a couple of young men to go back there and get them. And you might hold your hand up and they'll pass them out to you in case you, if you, if you don't have this, get a hold of Sister Connie. I'm always throwing everything at Connie. But this lesson is inside your booklet of your 52 Bible lessons. It's one of the lessons in there that I'll actually be springing off of today on, on that. So, uh, and we'll get into these scriptures here pretty soon. But let's continue reading. Now, let me just say something before we get, I've got so many things on my mind. In church world and theological quote world whatever that is there are people who believe in post it's called post millennial what do you mean by that they believe that Jesus was not going to come till after the millennial reign I, I can't for my life of me can't get where they get this at because it's a natural sequence through the book of Revelation he comes here not here but they believe and this was by the way this was real prevalent in the early 1900s late 1800s in America most churches taught it I don't know how they did it. Somehow or another, they believed that the church was going to so influence the world as going to bring universal peace and a utopia. And then after that was done, Jesus would come. And that's just not totally opposite what the Bible teaches. Bible teaches going to get worse and worse before the Lord comes back. That's what's going to happen. Just the opposite. And Christ is going to come, and then he'll set up this kingdom. Now, in Matthew chapter 6, when you say the Lord's Prayer, what did he teach? Thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven that's going to happen and how it's going to happen he's going to rule with the rod of iron there's two or three things now i'm not what you call a hyper dispensationalist a hyper dispensationalist tries to just force anything he wants to believe into a time segment in history and that don't work i don't like it but I am a dispensationalist in the fact that the Bible teaches that there are time periods in which God deals with mankind in, in different manners and for different purposes and so forth. The thousand year reign is a dispensation. Now there's one thing in common of all dispensations, starting from Genesis, and that is that man, once he fell into sin, was so totally depraved that there was no situation that human, humanity could, could create that would fix him outside of the new birth. Amen. Because people ask this question. At the end of the millennial reign, so, think about this. They're not going to be able to say, well, the devil made me do it. I'm just fighting the devil every day. No, you, in the millennial reign, you ain't fighting the devil every day. He's in the, he's in the bottom of his pit. So what excuse are you going to have for your sin now? At the end of it, we're going to read this a bit, Satan is loosed out of his bottomless pit, and he immediately gets a rebellion going. How does he do that? Because man is desperately wicked, deceitful of all things. Now let's get, oh my land, my brains are rolling. Here we go. <clears throat> we, had the, we had this tribulation period, all right, and it ended with Christ coming back. What about the people who were living in the tribulation period that are still living? That were not raptured out with new glorified bodies what about us that are coming back with Christ see you don't need to watch Star Wars and all that rocket man to get out amen you don't even know the half of what the wild you want to get wild you read your Bible <clears throat> you and I are raptured out if you're saved born again you get raptured out or resurrected and you have a new glorified body and you're with Christ forever and so you're Christ, the judgment seat, Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, while the tribulation is going on down here, you come back with Jesus Christ, you're coming back to rule and reign with Him for a thousand years in a new glorified body. But there are people who went through the tribulation who don't have a glorified body. And they're going to be in the kingdom. And they're going to have families and children. And... And they need to be saved. And they're, and they're going to live. <clears throat> you say, well, I don't understand. With Jesus' ruling, how could all that happen? Let me just tell you something. 
Mom and daddy can be home. That don't mean a kid's heart's right. They're just waiting for the chance. They're just waiting. You know, or somebody can have a rebellious toward the, toward the uh, uh, law, local authority. You know, somebody wanting to rob a house. He's just waiting for the chance. When they robbed our house, they, they, they figured out the chance. They figured out when we was at church. They just, the thievery was already in their heart. The, being the thief, the sin, the wickedness was, was already in here. It was just waiting for a time to manifest itself. This is why Christianity is the only faith in the world. This is why Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. You've got to be born again. New, new birth is the only thing that will fix us. Amen. Reformation and religion and uh, all that stuff, none of it will fix you. And I want to challenge you here today. You may have been in church 40 years, but I'll tell you, have you been born again? Amen. But anyway, these people are going to go through this millennial reign. They're going to have families. A thousand years, there's going to be a lot of people born. And those people, uh, some of them, are go- they're, only going to, they're only doing right because they have to, because of who's ruling. And the second Satan is let out, boom, they're ready to join him in a rebellion. Well, let's read about it. Verse number two, let's pick it up. Laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, bound him a thousand years, cast him into the bottom pit, and shut him up that he should sit, and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And the reason he's being loosed is because every dispensation, God tests mankind. Did you know one of the most prominent things that's believed in America right now, that if we could just create the right environment for people, they wouldn't act like they do. You know what God's going to do? He's going to create a wonderful environment. No devil. And he's going to create uh, all kinds of things. We'll be reading about this in the prophets. But man's still a sinner. You can move him. <laughs> Karen and I lived in the mobile home. It was moving into our house didn't change my heart. <laughs> I still read Skelly. Okay, and um, boy, I, I'll just, I'm just going to say this. I heard a black preacher preaching this week, and I mean, he was shelling the corn. And he said, some of you making excuses that you were raised in the ghetto or blah, 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 and all that stuff. And he said, you're making all these excuses. He said, the problem with you is Jesus is not in your heart. Amen. And he said, the day, you're never going to get fixed till the day you decide you quit blaming your mommy and your daddy and where you live and this and that and the other. And that's the same thing with white folks, too. But he was letting them. I got to tell you, boy, I mean, he was letting them have it. Amen. <laughs> I've often wondered why God didn't make me black. I'd been a good black preacher, amen. I'm just serious. I'm, 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 yeah, man. Thank you, Mama. We have the family split right here. Thank you. I'll tell you what, I don't know how a guy like you has such a sweet mama for it. Do you? I don't understand it. I don't know how that comes. <laughs> I love you, brother. I tell you, I appreciate it. Well, he said there, verse 9, he's going to lose him for a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. This is Matthew 25. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped a beast. And his image neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their heads, hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Boy, I tell you what. Those are people that came through the tribulation and did not. Look at what it said. They were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Why are you talking about that? By the way, there's a resurrection in that situation. But verse number five. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. Now, second death is being cast into the lake of fire. And God said these, that there's no, second death hath no power on them. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. <clears throat> when a thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog, and you go back to Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39 to read about that, and gather them together to battle. 
the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So Satan's been loosed. He's come up, and he's going out to deceive the nations. And uh, he gathers them together to battle in verse number 9. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints round about and the beloved city. That appears to me to be uh, in the land of Israel, Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. It's over almost as fast as it started. And verse number 10, probably one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. So you had the beast, the false prophet, already down there in the lake of fire, which is a separate place from the bottomless pit, <clears throat> where the beast, the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I want you to mark that verse in your Bible. Satan is your enemy. Yes, he does give you a hard time. But there's going to come a day when God's going to cast him into the lake of fire and he's going to be tormented day and night forever and forever. Amen. There's things going to end one of these days. God's going to conquer. And God's going to come out victorious. And I'm going to be honest with you. I want to jump and do a backflip. God throws him in the lake of fire. I'm going to shout the victory. Amen. But you know what I can do? I can shout today because that's, that is, I, I can tell him. If he was sitting up there on a the light stand, I'd look at him and say, you're headed to the lake of fire. Amen. By the way, did you know he knows that? He knows it's true, too. That's why he, the Bible talks about he knows he had but a little time is fierce anger because he knows his time is coming. And let me just tell you something about Satan. His greatest victory that he could possibly have is to drag somebody to hell with him. Don't let him do it to you. Get saved. Don't let him do it. Well... Um, Verse number 11, chapter 20 uh, ends. Now, we've come all the way through that chapter, all the way through this thousand-year reign. And at the end of it there, Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. Verse number 11, and I saw a great white throne. At the end of this right here, this, and I just, I'm just going to draw a box for the throne, but there's going to be a great white throne. <clears throat> We're going to read it just for sake of reading, but this is when the... This occurs. Now, we, this is why you need to be taught about the judgments in the Bible. A lot of people got it in their head, and they've heard preaching, that somehow or another at the end of everything, you're going to stand before God at the great white throne judgment. A child of God is not standing at this judgment. Amen. This is a judgment. No, nobody is in this judgment except lost people. God's people have already had their sins judged. They had them judged at the cross of Calvary. There Christ was judged in our place for our sin. And when you believed on him and received him as your Savior, your sins were dealt with judicially before God Almighty. And his, his righteous wrath against sin was satisfied. And there is therefore now no condemnation in, which walk in, uh, in Christ Jesus who walked not after that flesh. But the judgment against your sin and, your, and, and you being a sinner is dealt with at the cross. That's the whole deal about when you got saved. Now, as a child of God, after you got saved, God says there's several judgments going on. God asks you, first of all, judge yourself. God says, you're my son. I want you to judge yourself. If you did wrong, be honest about it. I've had to do that this week. I've had to say, Reggie, you're wrong about an issue. You were wrong about your attitude. You were wrong about your response. And I'm just telling you the truth. I don't know how you get along, but I just have to do that occasionally because I get, I get in my flesh and I act wrong or say wrong or do wrong and I have to just get honest about it. God wants us to judge ourselves so that we'll not be judged. All right. But when Christ comes back to take the church out, there is going to be what's called the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ is an entirely different thing. And we are judged according to our works. Now think with me. We are not saved by works. It is not a judgment to, be, to determine whether you're saved or not. And right here, we're going to hit one of the most important things you'll ever, it'll ever strike your mind as a Christian. You are going, and I are going to live forever with what we've done as a Christian on this earth. 
And the issue is not whether you were some big blah, blah, blah Christian. The issue, did you live for Christ in the capacity that he gave you to live in your life? Did you put him first in your life? Did you honor him with your life? What kind of spirit did you live your Christian life in? What did you do for the cause of Christ in the capacity in the arena that you could? There's a, a little lady in the New Testament I just love. You know what it said about her? She hath done what she could. That's all God asks of you to do. Do what you can for Jesus' sake. Danny just preached a message last week. No, I can pray. Right, Danny? Was that the title of it? I can pray. Why do we think it's so little? Why do we not think that praying for people is not way more important than we act like? <clears throat> but here's the thing. We're going to be judged. Now, as a Christian person, the Bible says some men's sins go before. If you confess your sins now to God, all right, that they're dealt with. But if you're covering it, justifying it, rationalizing it, won't deal with it, you're going to face that sin at the judgment seat of Christ. And in 1 Corinthians, it tells you that you will lose rewards over all this. Now, I want to tell you something. This may be selfish, probably is. But something motivates me a little bit about serving God. That I'm going to live forever with the rewards that I receive if I get any at the judgment seat of Christ. Jim wasn't important to us, he wouldn't have told us about it. Amen. You're right. right. <laughs> he wants us to know about it. All the Bible indicates that we should be enthused, concerned, excited about these eternal rewards and the eternal condition that we're going to enter into eternity with. And I'm not talking about a competition to see who can own. Because the Bible talks about even putting it cast in your crowns at the feet of Jesus. Okay, but the raw truth of it is, it tells you that you're going to be judged. There's wood, there's there's a wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, and precious stones. Those are the characteristic God gives of our works at the judgment seat of Christ. So we're living forever, and I, I'm honest with you. You know, I, I at this stage in life, I look back when Karen and I got married, and all I was trying to think about was trying to get out of debt and get a home and make be a good husband to her, so she could have something, and you know, and just you know, think trying to how can I make more money, and how can I you know be a quote, quote successful, and um, you know, right now I just kind of my whole focus has just shifted. I mean, it's just easier, and I don't expect you young people to, I, I just, it's just hard to see, because you know the reality of it is, you know, you want to have a home, you want to have some things, and take care of your family, you want your children to be able to have a few nice things, and so forth, I understand that. But the reality of it is, we're living in the light of eternity. And, and those things are going to be, and he said, lay, set your treasures, lay your treasures up in heaven, where, you know, set your affections on things above. And, and he said, this stuff, that's what's going to last. And they're, they're, what was the old say, what's the old saying? That only one life until soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. You know, and I'm going to be honest, we're not here playing church this morning. This is why we need to come to church. I need this. I need to be reminded every Sunday. Reggie, eternity's coming. Eternity's coming. Don't live for this world. And in this world, while you're in it, do right. Live right. When you do wrong, fix it. Honor Christ. Obey the Bible. Get more grace. Humble yourself more. Be honest with yourself. <clears throat> you know, honor the Lord in your life. Yes. Yeah, Red, you were saying that you have to get right with God, and there's just something in you when you make mistakes, but that's a conviction from the Holy Spirit yeah, because you're saved. You, you don't do it because it's like, I'm going to be this for God or this and that. There's... Once you're saved, there's a conviction from the Holy Spirit that turns you it, and, and yeah, I, you want to do right by God. I can tell you right now, you know the way I knew I was saved? Because before I saved, I didn't give a rip. Yeah, amen. I didn't care how it affected you. But after I got saved, then the Holy Spirit within. Uh, we're going to be in First Thessalonians before very long. Uh, quench not the Spirit. 
And while we preach that, we'll preach grieve not the Spirit. There's two things you can do with the Holy Spirit in the sense of your life each day, and that's quench or grieve the Holy Spirit and so forth. We'll deal with those. But the Holy Spirit's going to bring that conviction. Hey, you didn't do right. You didn't have the right attitude. You got in the flesh. Why don't you just get honest with yourself? Quit ju- and your mind will start running. Quit justifying. Well, the Holy Spirit's something else. Quit justifying it. You know what you're doing right now. You're justifying your wrongdoing. How many in here can paint out what you do as the wonderful thing, no matter what you do? Well, I had to rob the bank. We were out of money. I mean, the bankers got lots of it. Why should they have it all? <laughs> Why did I leave my wife? Well, she wouldn't cook, and she uh, 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 alienation of affection. We got all these excuses for anything we want to do, but I don't. Have, where, where did we get there from? From thousand year rain? I don't know. <clears throat> anyway, so let's go. Uh, let's read here on the Great White Throne Judgment. So what I'm, yeah, what I'm trying to say is, this Great White Throne Judgment that occurs after the thousand year rain <clears throat> is not for Christian people. The only possibility of being there would be as a witness. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, will be not. That's not doesn't say in there, but there there might be that because in any judgment court situation, there are usually witnesses. You know, of course, all the witnesses you really got to have is Christ. I saw a great white throne, verse 11, him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. I don't know where this is going to occur at. I don't know where the great white throne is going to occur at. It says the earth and heaven fled away there. Somewhere out in the galaxies, I suppose. There'll be a great white throne set up. <clears throat> and God, the Lord, by the way, the Father said he put all judgment into the hands of the Son. So you can just figure who's going to be here. Jesus Christ. That's him that sat on the throne. And there was no place found for them. That's it. Underline that in your Bible. There was no place found for them. Jesus said in John 14, I go away to prepare a place for you. These people have no place for them. There's no place with God for these people. <clears throat> and I saw the dead. Now, when you read about the dead in the Bible, especially in context, there's, there's physical death, but there's spiritual death. And this specifically is referring it not just to those physical, that is to the spiritually dead people. Spiritually, it's the physical, spiritual dead people. The dead, small and great, stand before God. These people... Watch this. The dead standing before God. So that tells you what that the inference there is is to spiritual death. They are dead. That you, you before you were saved, you were dead in trespasses and in sins. We were made alive in Christ. This is another of the beauty of Christianity. I, I don't. That's why I don't like dead church services. <laughs> I don't like dead singing. I tell Karen, I don't like dead kissing. <laughs> I just don't like nothing dead, amen. Well, that deer tenderloin's not bad, but anyway. I, but he's talking about spiritually dead, have no life. What does God give you when you get saved? Eternal what? Life. God, boy, I tell you what I like. When Jesus told that bunch of Pharisees, he said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac. He said, I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. Amen. Anyway, and it's great. Look at that statement. Underline it in your Bible. Stand before God. Every lost person is going to stand before God. Boy, what a, th- what a scene. What a thought. Stand before God. A God who knows every thought. That goes through every person's mind. God who knows every attitude. Who knows every motive. Who knew, who, who knew what was going on behind the door. Behind the mind. Behind the outward expression. <clears throat> every word. Every action. Thought. Motive. Deed. Attitude. Stand before God. And the books were open. <clears throat> and another book was open. Which is the book of life. Now, I believe the first reference there, we're not even close to our Sunday school class, but I don't care. We'll get there. 
We're in the Bible. That's the main thing counts. Books were open. Now, I'm going to throw you what I think that is, okay? I might be wrong. Brother Josh, I think that's the Bible. The Bible is 66 books. And we're going to be judged out of the Bible. Not going to be judged by registered preaching. By the Bible. And I'm telling you, this will put the fear of God in you. Books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. Now, I believe there is a book of life where your name is written in if, in the book of life. Amen. That's separate. Uh, and it's, it says there, And the dead were judged out of those things according, which were written in the books according to their works. So what, what God has said in the Bible, it, he's not going to just arbitrarily grab things out of the air. He's going to bring up an accusation, and then he'll show in the Word of God... By the way, this gets back to the subject of Jesus Christ being the Word. <clears throat> and, and the Bible says it, it'll all be brought into account. Every thought, every de everything be brought into judgment. By the way, if you don't think that's powerful, one of the works of the flesh that Jesus gives is evil thoughts. That's one of the first things. For out of the heart of man proceedeth evil thoughts. Thoughts. <clears throat> um, verse number 13, the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Somebody said, well, the fish ate them. I don't care. Had the ashes scattered over the water. I don't care. He bringing you up. Uh, by the way, lost people will have a resurrected, some type of resurrected body. Amen. That's clear. The Bible says both of, both will have resurrected. You ain't just Christians that have a new body. I don't know what kind of body they'll have. But let me just tell you one thing. The Bible is very clear. You go to Luke chapter 16. and Again, I'm just going to say this. You want, to, you, want, you want to blow your mind? Just study the Bible. And you'll run into things. You say, man, I don't understand how that could be. Just believe it anyway. Amen. Just believe it anyway. And say, you believe first, understand later. That's usually the, that's usually the procession way God goes. <clears throat> usually you just believe first, and you'll understand it later. But it may take time. Anyway, sea gave up the dead, death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. They wanted to live by their works and die by their works. They're going to be judged by their works. Do not go there. I love that song that you hear every once in a while now. <clears throat> There's a, a, a mother and two daughters, if you ever get a chance to hear it, that sing, that sing the song, I, I Know How I Made It. I know how I made it. I made it by grace. You're not going to heaven any other way but grace. Amen. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. You and I are never going to be good enough. And that's why Christ will get all the glory. Boy, I'm glad of that. Amen. <laughs> that, that makes me laugh in my soul. Jesus is going to get all the glory. <clears throat> and watch verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So you have physical death, you have spiritual death, and you have a second death. The second death is when you're cast into the lake of fire. Now, I'm just going to do this for say, maybe understanding's sake. Let's say that let's say that you're here in, in time period right now, okay, and you die. Probably they'll put you in a casket. But what happened to you? They put your body in the casket. But what happened to you? <clears throat> you have a spirit and you have a soul. The body's in here, in, in the grave. In, in the grave. <clears throat> what, ha what does the Bible teach happens to people when they die? If you're saved, if you're, saved you're with the Lord. If you're absent from the body, it will be present with the Lord. I probably told you this before. I was preaching a, I preached a funeral, and I was, preaching a under, was under the tent at the graveside service. I knew the person. The best I knew, they were saved persons. Up here at Mountain Grove, at the cemetery up there. And I said that verse, to die is gain, to be with Christ, which is far better, you know, that kind of thing. And I walked out of the tent, and this guy, he come, I've had this happen more times than you can dream. 
I hate to say this, but I get leery of anybody coming, coming. <laughs> you know, I just, you know, that's just me. But anyway, I'm the reason being because I've just been hit. And this guy walked with me, and he kind of comes up, and he, says, and he started leaning his head, walking along, and said, you just lied to them people in there. You lied to them people in there. I said, how did I lie to them people in there? You said you told them he was a Jesus. I said, they're in that grave. They're not anywhere but in that ground. I said, well, you don't believe the Bible, do you? Yeah, I believe the Bible. I said, no, you do not. I just quoted scripture. And I said, another thing, why didn't you pop up while I was in the tent and say all this stuff? But you wait till I use like a spider. I got in the flesh. Right after I got done preaching. <laughs> I mean, seriously, that stuff makes me tired. If it's so important to you, why don't you just jump up and jump the preacher right when he's preaching what you don't like? Quit being a coward about it. You know, just buzz you while you're walking off. I don't like that. Y'all like that? I don't like that. I know I'm in the flesh. But anyway, you know, it just starts on stuff. I can remember that. Not good memory. Accuse you of lying to the family. I said, so where's he at? He said, I said, you, he said well, he's sleep. He, sleeping means they're just asleep in the grave. I said, I ain't sleeping. Jesus told him, said, Lazarus is dead. And they're using the word sleep, and Jesus said, finally, he's dead. But anyway, Ralph, please pray for me. Yeah, a rich man, you know, lift up the eyes in hell. Lazarus was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, which we went through that. What I was trying to get to is that let's say that you're lost. Okay, we know that. But if you were lost, your spirit and soul went to the heart of the earth. Went to hell, which is in the heart of the earth. You read your Old Testament, you'll find they went down to the pit, down to the pit, down to Ezekiel. Was over and over and over again, they went down to the pit. Where's down? It's in the heart of the earth. And... At this great white throne judgment, the Bible talks there'll be a resurrection. It'll come and stand before God. God's going to resurrect, resurrect, that, resurrect that body, bring him up out of hell. Yes. Acts 24, Paul's preaching. He says that they have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate that. Give that verse again. We need to write it. It's Acts 24 what? Acts 24, 15. Acts 24, 15. be a good verse for you to write down in conjunction with this. So God brings up the dead. Those that died in Christ are with Christ. That's, this is a statement you ought to remember for all your life. With Christ. With Christ. Here we're in Christ. There we'll be with Christ. Forever. There'll never be a time when you're not with him. Amen. I used to tell Karen, if I hadn't wanted to be with you, I wouldn't have married you. Any husband really loves his wife wants to be with her. You can tell me, Amen. when you have a spirit, you, want, you don't want to be with them. You got problems. Amen. You got problems. And my bridegroom is going to have his bride with him. Amen. Amen. Well, then verse number 15, the, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, we're not going there. Just I'm, I'm heading somebody off going... Let's study about the book of life, about the name being blotted out. Big issue. A lot in the Bible about it. A lot of people use it as a basis to lose your salvation, but if, if you'll study it through all the way, you'll find out it's not that at all. Amen. And uh, But anyway, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Now we're going to go back to your lesson there. And uh, I wanted to do this here so, to get a, a basis of it. All okay, right, now, definition. Millennial means a thousand years. Uh, we use the word to denote a thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. <clears throat> I don't use the word millennium a lot. I'd rather use the thousand years because that's the Bible terminology for it, okay? So we're going to look at the predictions of the millennium. Guys, do you have a copy of that by any chance with you up there? If, uh, if you don't, could you get somebody get them boys a copy? I'd like to put up some of these verses, just especially for people that don't have it. But uh, David in Psalm 72 8. Let's go to Psalm 72 8. Now. <clears throat> Throw this at you. Psalm 72, 8. Probably ought to do this also. 
the corresponding book in your Bible with the millennial reign primarily is the book of Psalms. You read the book of Psalms all about the king, 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 the king. The tribulation period right here is your book of Job. 42 chapters, great tribulation, three and a half years. Time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, you, you can take that thing back all the way to, to the resurgence of the Jewish people into the land. The sequence of the books are prophetic even in the way they're listed. Okay, Psalm 72, <clears throat> 8. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. Uh, let's go back to Psalm 72, 1. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the son, king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness, and thy poor with judgments. The mountains shall bring peace to the people, and little hill by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy, and shall break in pieces the oppressor. Does that sound like ruling with a rod of iron? How many in here are saved? Raise your hand. You could be there in just a few years. You could be there within seven years. You could be in this kingdom. You're headed there. And I'd get interested in it if I was you. And I'd get excited about it, happy about it. It's a good deal. If you're saved, I mean, tell you, you talk about something else. It's coming. <clears throat> they shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass, the showers that were the earth. In his days shall righteous flourish an abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. I want to issue the, deal with the issue of peace here for a little bit. Man here thinks, thinks he likes to think that he can make peace. Political leaders constantly talking about peace, 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 peace. We, you know what? The Mideast is not going to have peace till Jesus comes. I'm telling you, it ain't happening. There's not going to be peace on this earth till Jesus comes. Then, But there will be peace. We're going to find out that they'll, they'll destroy all the war material. Because there ain't going to be no wars during this millennial reign. We'll read about that later on. Now, we're going to be next week getting into a lot of the verses here. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> and look at verse number 9. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall do what? Lift it up. <laughs> I'm telling you, he's king of kings and lord of lords. You say, well, I ain't bowing for him. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, you've got to understand, how many know that just a little honor streak runs through me? But see, that honor streak has to do with, I want the devil defeated, sin defeated, unrighteous. I want Jesus to rule and reign. I'm looking forward to the time when he puts his enemies down. I mean, I'm telling you, I'm liable to skip when his enemies lick the dust. Amen. You say, you shouldn't enjoy something. Well, I'm going to. Sorry. Right. I'm going to be glad. Right. <clears throat> anyway, verse number 11. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. Look at this. All nations shall serve him. And, this going to, and you read uh, uh, verse 17, the last part, it says, All nations shall call him blessed. Verse 19, let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. amen. This is, there's all kinds of millennial songs, which you'll think when you start reading the song, just, just think about, where's this, where, where's this, because the psalms are a lot of, they're not just devotional, they're a lot of it prophetic. Uh, go to Psalms 89. Psalms 89. I don't think you have that. You might want to write this down. Psalms 89. And verse number 3, I've made a covenant with my chosen sworn unto David, my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Christ is going to set upon the throne of his father, David. David Jesus even asked the Pharisees if, 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 if about the Lord. He said, my Lord said, said to my Lord. David said, who is that? And they didn't know how to answer him. I, we'll go, I'm getting off beat here. <clears throat> uh, let's go to verse 35 in that chapter. Verse 35. Once I have sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David, his seed shall endure ever, and his throne as the sun before me. 
Verse 37, it shall be established forever as the moon is a faithful witness in heaven. Selah. What is that talking about? The throne of David. What is that? The kingdom of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's go to Jeremiah 23. <clears throat> Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. You say, Reggie, what's this make you so happy for? I'm sick of what I'm hearing on the news. I'm sick of the way America's headed. I, I, I mean, I'm just telling you. I, I, can I just tell you something? In Jesus' reign, there's not going to be no child molesting. Amen. In Jesus' reign, there's going to be no kidnapping of little kids. In Jesus' reign, there ain't going to be no butchering of babies in somebody's womb. See, our concept of God, we think God's up going, eh, you know, I, don't, I know that ain't the best, but I don't really mind. No. Mm-mm. Rod of iron. Amen. No bending. Amen. And you know what? Today, you've got a choice how to serve him. Amen. You can serve him with your heart out of love Amen. because he's righteous and good. Yes. He's a wonderful king. Yes. Well, you can serve him out of I have to and, and, break, and break his law and rule every chance you get. But then in this kingdom we're talking about, it ain't going to happen. You're going to be into it. He would deal with you. Uh, <clears throat> man alive, if I can get where I need to be at. Jeremiah 23, verse number uh, 5. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I'll raise unto David a righteous branch. Look at the capital B. And a king shall reign and prosper, and he shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. He's going to reign out of, the, out of Jerusalem. <clears throat> I, I, my, my little peanut brain is running so many circles. But right now, did you know there's a constant battle for Jerusalem? Yeah. Why? Why not Rio de Janeiro or some place in Brazil? Why is it that the news is full about Jerusalem and that little bitty old piece of land that ain't bigger from here to Kansas? That's exactly put his name there. And that's where Jesus is going to reign. There's a battle over the satanic warfare. Verse number 6, in his days Judah shall be saved. Israel's going to be saved. Paul said that in Romans chapter 11. Yeah. Yeah. So all Israel shall be saved. They're going to turn to Jesus. They're going to turn to the Lord. They're going to see him who he is. It won't be blindness like it is now. By the way, you got an attitude toward the Jews? Did you know something? God blinded them so that you and I could be grafted in. Right. Right. Yes, sir. Yes. My land living. Just in case somebody tuned in late, we're for the Jews, we're for Israel. Amen. And Israel shall dwell how? Look at that, verse number 6. How are they going to dwell then? That's not now. That's in the millennial reign. Millennial reign? Ain't, no, ain't going to be no Hamas breaking across some fence. Ain't going to be no Iranians threatening to drive them into the Mediterranean Sea all the time. Ain't going to be no sorry low-down sow like we got up here in the U.S. Congress saying they're going to drive them in from the sea to the sea. Marching around with a Palestinian flag makes me sick. It ain't right. I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me. God's looking down. He's watching us put up with these people marching around with Palestinian flags and signs about hate the Jews and drive them into the sea. And I think God's looking down saying, you going to put up with this? You're going to become, you're going to touch the apple of my eye? Verse 7. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. It's just the truth. I'm so sick of these wimpy, noodle backbone guys that won't say nothing. The women in Congress have got more guts than the men in Congress. That's the truth. It's a pitiful shame. Men all worried about getting elected again. Yeah. The Lord our righteous. Well, let's Romans chapter eight. Go to Romans chapter eight. Oh, land! It's ten forty-five. Stop right here. We got to go. Everybody, mark right there. I know we didn't get too far, but next week we'll take off on these here, uh, these here uh, references. And we got a lot of ground to cover. There's lots and lots of more in the Bible, in the Old Testament about the millennial reign than almost any other subject. Because it's talking about the second coming of Christ and Christ comes back in that reign. That's what they were looking forward 
<clears throat> that the, the disciples even asked, you know, are you going to set up your kingdom now? They were looking forward to that kingdom. And when Jesus died on the cross, we thought the kingdom was going to be set up. And they were disappointed. And they just didn't see that there was a plan of God for the Gentiles between that and the kingdom. Let's stand together. Get you a song book this morning. How many knows in here I still love you? Please don't get mad at me because I get kind of serious. All right? <clears throat> I just... Hey, this is the most important stuff you've ever heard all week long, <laughs> to be honest with you. Brother Caleb, you still loving that wife God gave you? She a pretty good wife? He a pretty good husband? All right. Boy, they're still on the honeymoon. Hey, man. They're still on the honeymoon. You stay on that honeymoon. You stay on that honeymoon. Caleb, would you dismiss us? I appreciate you. Well, I tell you, I like to see young men grow up in church, love God, serve God, get married to a godly woman. And they come walking into church on Sunday morning. I like that. Amen. Amen. You can't beat that. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the, the truth we've heard from your word today, Lord, about your coming and that you're coming soon, Lord, and the things we can expect, Lord. Yes. I just pray, Lord, that uh, we wouldn't have any kind of fear in our hearts. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We know that Satan's under your thumb, Lord, and, and nothing he does will ever get past you, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that we would live by faith and just yes. trust you for everything that happens in our lives. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for everything you've done, for everything you are. We bless your holy name this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All righty, let's come and sing.